Thanks a lot, Gail. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome back Mr. Sean Gilbertson, Executive Director, Gemfields. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen, Honourable Minister. Uh, the whispering in my ear over there was to tell me that I had to finish in two minutes. <laughs> so um, please have a cup of coffee and try to keep up as we squeeze four years into 120 seconds. I'm going to speak to you very briefly about what I believe is a model collaboration between investors and the government of the Republic of Zambia. Bit of a play on words here with the British model, Lily Cole, sporting a couple of Zambian emeralds. This is Gemfield's existing structure inside of Zambia. Our focus today is going to be the Kajum Emerald Mine, which you've already heard about. Gemfields, which is listed on the AIM market here in London, owns 75% of Kajum. The other 25% belongs to the government. It's the world's single largest emerald mine. It employs 430 people. It runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is no other operation like it in the colour gemstone business. It's in Zambia. Number two, we also own 50%, with government having the other 50% of the Kariba Amethyst Mine. That employs 340 people, it's in Zambia, and it's the world's largest amethyst mine. Quick observations about the colored gemstone sector. It's been overlooked. No one's ever really paid any attention to it. De Beers did a wonderful marketing job and took everybody's attention away. It's a very fragmented sector, so there is an opportunity for consolidation. There is some hope of vertical integration. It's a very undercapitalized sector. It does not have the scale, it does not have the capital, it does not have the skills, it does not have the equipment. And after the session finishes this afternoon, if you pop onto Bond Street, walk up and down and look at all the color in the windows, emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. My favorite saying is, once you've had a color television, you never go back to black and white. <laughs> Then just a quick word about value. Some of these things are worth a lot of money, but obviously you also get a lot of production which isn't worth very much. At the very top end of the spectrum, and these are one in a billion stones, have a look at the example on the far right hand side here. This was a 10 carat emerald. It sold at auction for $62,000 per carat. That's a $600,000 stone, and it weighs only two grams. If you pick up a few grains of sugar on your table, that's $600,000. These are some photographs of the Kajum Emerald Mine. Aerial shot, we're basically 25 kilometers south-southwest of Kitwe. That's what the inside of the pit looks like. That's an aerial photograph. You can see some of the 25 and 40 ton dump trucks running around. And the pit is presently 100 meters deep, and it runs about 1.6 kilometers in a sort of smiley shape. We acquired this operation four years ago. It was not in a good state. There was a lot of cleaning up to be done, a lot of investment to be made. We've invested tens of millions of dollars in new mining equipment. You can see the depth of the pits increased here compared to the previous photograph. We have new drill rigs. And for the first time in the history of Zambian emerald mining, we're underground. This has never been done before. It's a trial exercise, and it has the potential to transform and reduce the amount of waste stripping that has to be done in order to get at the emeralds. But it's a trial project, and we won't know the outcome of that for a year or two yet. If you get your mining right, hopefully you can get your production up. The red arrow over here shows you the point at which Gemfields acquired 75% of Kajum. And as you can probably tell, we've managed to get the production levels up quite nicely. You will, however, note that the production has a nasty habit of going up and down. Welcome to colored gemstone mining. It's not like gold, it's not like platinum, it's not like copper, where the seam is fairly homogenous. It comes in big pockets. You go through a pocket in a couple of months, you get lovely production. Then you have to wait until the next pocket comes along. Worse, you don't know where those pockets are. You can guess, and even when you find the pocket, it doesn't always contain emeralds. So it's 20% science, 80% art. This is the same graph, but annualized. Our involvement started here, and roughly speaking, you'll be able to see that we have tripled the production. Remember that figure, triple the production.
Once you've got the production, you've got to sell it. Historically, a lot of the material was sold locally, informally, in the bars, in the nightclubs, in the restaurants. There were no formal processes. So what we've started to do is to professionalize that process. Gemfield sets up approximately three or four auctions every year. We invite the 25 to 30 top emerald rough buying companies in the, on the planet. You can see some of the buyers here. All of our parcels are very, very, very carefully sorted to take out as much risk as we possibly can. We standardize the color, standardize the size, standardize the clarity. If we can take the risk out, then the customer is willing to pay more for it. At the end of a five-day period, which the customers spend looking at all of the rough, they submit a sealed bid. It goes into this box. And at the end of the auction on a Friday afternoon, this committee, which includes a representative of the government of the Republic of Zambia, who sits directly on the Kajum board, and the chairman of Kajum, Mr. Stephen Malama, State's Council, will get together, break the seal under camera, and we then sit in their presence, opening up all the papers and working out who has won which lot by virtue of the fact of who's paid the most money for them. That's one of the hexagonal emerald crystals. And when all is said and done, this is what the room looks like when we announce the results. And we will say that lot number A has been sold to ABC company. Lot number B has been sold to XYZ company. Lot number C has not sold because it didn't meet our minimum price. So that the market basically has full transparency with the exception of the price. To support those sales, you then need to advertise. In keeping with our tradition of turning things on their head and doing it differently, we did not focus on Porsches, Lamborghinis, Miami, and the lifestyle that comes with these things. Instead, we focused on the source. We went directly to our employees on Cardrum, and they formed the basis of our first advertising campaign, which had quite the impact on the market. And I hope there isn't anybody from Anglo-American here, but I think you nicked our idea about six months later. <clears throat> they have bigger advertising budget, which is why you see them in Heathrow and not us. For our downstream customers, in other words, the people we sell the rough to, we provide them with marketing materials. They're our customers, we give them support. So this is our most recent advertising campaign. We send them posters, both bearing the Gemfield's name and not bearing the Gemfield's name, so that they have the tools with which to promote emeralds. We have promotional programs. In this one, we worked with the World Land Trust in order to support and raise money, in this case for Indian elephants. The African elephant program is coming next. We started in India because that's where the bulk of the production ends up. This is one of the famous Indian Bollywood stars called Madhuri Dixit. And we brought in sponsors like Jaguar and Land Rover. And we had a number of Indian jewelers design pieces of jewelry around Zambian emeralds from the Kajum mine. Those pieces went on tour throughout India. And in October of this year, we had a large auction in Bombay attended by many dignitaries. And we raised just short of 1 million US dollars on that night. If you pull up Google and you Google Emeralds for Elephants, that was the name of this project, you're going to get more than one million returns on Google. So programs like this, collaborative in nature, can be very effective. In all of that, a great deal of publicity gets generated. How many times on this page can you see Zambia? It's all about Zambia. Zambian emeralds sparkling in India. The jewel in Zambia's crown. The fact that Zambian emeralds have come to the United Kingdom. <coughs> Very importantly, Zambia's ethical emerald mines. That message has resonated around the globe. And today, Zambia is identified as being the leading supplier of ethical emeralds. I was told recently that we've had an impact on tourism in Zambia. We invited the author of this article to visit our mine. <laughs> and he... <laughs> came away blown, blown away not only by the operation, but also by the country. And in the Times, he wrote a five-page article about why my heart belongs to Zambia. And only a portion of that was dedicated to us who'd gotten him there in the first place. Again, you can see Zambia's ethical emeralds, Zambia's emerald auction, Madhuri Dixit in India, who's a very, very big name, unveiling Zambian emeralds. Gemfields unveils exquisite Zambian emeralds. We are not restricted to smaller publications. Here, for example, we had the Financial Times, specifically an article dedicated to Zambian emeralds and gem fields. The International Herald Tribune. 
emeralds are kind of the next big thing if you're not getting the message. Um, the Wizards of Emerald City, another wonderful article that was published recently. This industry is very clandestine. It, nobody wants to tell you anything. They want to hide everything. They don't want to show you anything. They don't want to show you prices. They don't want to show you their operation. No photographs, all that kind of stuff. It's nonsense. The only way to fix this industry is to be 100% transparent. We invite anyone, journalists, our competitors from Colombia, our competitors locally in Zambia, we've had visitors from Brazil to come and see the mining operation and we show them everything. All of the information you see here, you can download yourselves directly off the Gem Fields website. These are the results of the high grade auctions that we have held to date. We published the number of people that were there. We published the number of carrots offered, the number of carrots that we sold. We publish the total US dollar receipts that we got from each one of those auctions. Note over this period of time, we started at $6 million in July 2009, and by July 2011, just two years later, we took 32 million US dollars. What's important here is the price per carat. We started at $4.40 per carat, $5.10 per carat, $9.35 per carat, $26 per carat, and most recently in July in Singapore, $42 per carat. That's approximately up tenfold. You'll recall I asked you earlier to remember that we've tripled production. Are there any economists in the room? Um, supply has tripled and the price has quadrupled. Supply is up, demand is up. It's supposed to be impossible. <laughs> Yet here is the proof. There are good reasons for that which uh, we don't have the time for. These are the low grade auctions of which we've held three. These we always hold in Jaipur. Again, you will see here we started at a lowly 31 cents per carat on average, went up to 77 cents per carat in March of this year, and in the one that was held just a fortnight ago, again at which always representatives of the government of the Republic of Zambia are present, we got $1.12 per carat. So on the lower grade material, we're coming up for approximately four time increases per carat, despite the world's economic wobbles. Same information, just plotted a little differently. The red charts are the lower grade auctions in US dollars per carat, and you can see the growth in the red bars. The green ones, which is the left-hand axis now, are the higher grade auctions. And again, you can see the growth in the per carat prices. A nice, happy story, long may it continue. Once you start putting things together, you have to turn to the corporate social responsibility. At present, in the Kitware and in Dola and in Kana areas, we're involved in um, the construction of two schools. We support three further ones. We constructed the Inkana Clinic, which we continue to support. We have planted 16,000 trees on our mining operation. If you'd like to step outside and start planting 16,000 trees, uh, it takes a little while. It's quite the undertaking. Um, and we're also involved with one of the local HIV AIDS programs. And very importantly, if you come to the Kaja mine for the visit, the vegetables you eat at our operation are purchased from a project, a farming project, that we started. We provide the seeds, the water pumps, the training, and then we buy back at market prices the vegetables. There's corporate social responsibility, the lip service version, and there's corporate social responsibility, the real practical on the ground version. The proof is always in the pudding, and I'd invite any one of you not only to visit the mine, but also to take a tour of these operations to see the difference that they make. These are our carrots. What makes the difference? Number one, you have to have a true partnership. You have to build trust. You can't build trust by concealing everything. That's why we publish everything. That has worked. Secondly, we like the fact that the government takes an, an active interest in the sector. And I believe that Zambia's prior experience with nationalization and the very dramatic graph that the Honorable Minister showed us earlier on is perhaps one of Zambia's greatest strengths. As an investor, we know that nationalization is not on the agenda because they have experienced firsthand the troubles caused by it. Many a time, I have wished to send my countryman, Julius Malema, at my expense to go to Zambia and understand that <laughs> message. Specifically in gemstones, the key is this, consistency of supply. 
And that's why you can increase the supply and increase the demand, because it's like fuel into the engine. If you can keep putting the fuel in, the gemstones, the engine keeps turning. And historically, because of the pockety nature of gemstone deposits, the supply is inconsistent. The engine keeps stopping. Nobody believes in it. They don't see that their future is going to come from it. So consistent supply is what it's all about. And then finally, there is obviously a very big push towards ethically produced products and ones that are transparently sourced and where you know where they're coming from. Quick guesses in the room. Do it in your head. Who's the world's single largest jewelry retailer? Got your answers? Walmart. By dollar value, it is Walmart. If you buy a piece of Walmart gold jewelry, the gold came from Rio Tinto. Because it's that important to them to demonstrate that the components in the jewelry that they sell come from serious mining companies. That is a trend which is with us, and in that respect, Zambia today is a leader. <coughs> Things we'd like to see. From our perspective, we welcome government participation. We're delighted with the fact that over the last four years, we've had government as a 25% shareholder in the Kaja mine, and that partnership has worked, and it will continue to deliver fruit. I've noted here that the correct level is critical because while Kajum has worked where we put up 100% of the money for 75% of the return, we have not yet been able to fix the amethyst operation where we only own 50% and it's not viable for us to put up 100% of the money for 50% of the return. So we'd be delighted to buy 25% honorable minister and we'd be delighted to invest and make it work because it can be done. If there's, one, if there's one thing you take away today, if you're looking at the mining sector, there is a single truth about mining. Just one. It's about scale. The operations have to be big. If you want a world-class industry or a company that's a world beater, it's got to be big. Mining and small scale, I'm sorry to say, are totally incompatible. Human beings have drawn boundary lines along licenses. We put up farm fences. Those things shouldn't matter. The deposits were put in the ground in a particular way and the deposits should be mined according to their natural occurrence. If you want world beaters as companies and industries. If you don't, stick to the boundaries way of doing it. Specifically on the gemstone front, I mentioned earlier on that we lose quite a lot of our emeralds to theft. Presently, we are prohibited by applicable Zambian law from buying the rough gemstones back ourselves and keeping them within our domain. That creates a number of problems because, as I mentioned, if somebody steals an emerald, they got it for nothing and they sell it for nothing. We invest a lot of money to get those emeralds out and have, to have the market cut down in that way is a significant problem. Number two, at present in Zambia, any person may possess and or sell rough gemstones. That encourages criminality. That encourages the inability to trace how those gemstones left the country. That means you can't recover the royalties. In an ideal world on our wish list, we believe that unless you are the holder of a mining license or a lapidary license that cuts and polishes gemstones, you should not be able to deal in rough gemstones. Polished, of course, anybody can do, but that's how you build a world-beating business. Finally, um, our CEO at Gemfields, a gentleman called Ian Hairbottle, and I thought I would end my presentation with him because he has recently been appointed a member of the Gemstone Hot 100, which is the, the best-looking 100 people in the gemstone sector. Um, I was not even shortlisted, um, and, and of course I joke a little, I wouldn't leave you hanging like that, so we'll finish like that. Thank you very much for your attention.